Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading. Since we took a break from IDW to cover the Archie version of the Chaotix story, I figured it was only right to take a look at what the UK was doing with the game. So today, we're going to take our very first look ever at Sonic the Comic, and specifically their rendition of Knuckles' Chaotix. Now, I only know the most basic of uh, things when it comes to the Fleetway version of Sonic the Comic, their wild and crazy version of Super Sonic, essentially. So I'll try and give you some background information when I can but if I miss anything specifically, I do apologize. We will be looking deeper into the Fleetway version of this book in the future. Right now, we're mostly focused on how they interpreted the Chaotix video game. And it actually doesn't take place in a Sonic story. It actually takes place in a Knuckles backup story in issue 53. And I should also mention, if you weren't already aware, Sonic the comic wasn't a traditional comic book. It was more of a magazine comic. If you grew up in the 90s in America, think of Nickelodeon magazine, Disney Adventures, hell, even Nintendo power if they had made their entire focus the comic books with some smatterings of previews and reviews and stuff like that. Anyway, we kick things off with a little bit of the aftermath of the Death Egg Saga, which, while I have not read the whole thing yet, I can already tell you is much better than what Archie did. Here we see Knuckles in the Chaos Chamber just feeling good about life and letting new readers know basically what's going on if you had not picked up the previous stories. Master Emerald is back in its pedestal, Chaos Emeralds are back to full power for the first time in centuries, which is awesome if you've checked out my hypersonic video that's kind of how i interpreted all that business from sonic 3 and knuckles but this i thought was really clever apparently with the chaos emeralds and the master emerald all together they form a force field around angel island and that kind of covers why robotnik wouldn't try to immediately attack once again i think this is a really clever idea well once knuckles is done talking to nobody he then hops into a mario pipe and heads on over to mushroom hill zone here he's checking in on the new inhabitants from emerald hill zone and again this is all from the fallout from the death egg saga. Robotnik was doing some screwy stuff there. They were losing their homes. Knuckles agreed to let them live there just as long as they stayed out of his way. Everything's looking cool so he continues his tour around the island, this time checking out the crater left behind by the Death Egg. Again, really cool. Already this is stuff I would have enjoyed a lot more as a kid. I really wanted to see the aftermath of that story and I didn't even get that in the Archie series. Well, Knuckles glides on down and finds this ancient, well, portal, really. I think this is an interpretation of the warp rings from Sonic 3 and Knuckles, which I think is really cool. If you recall from the original Japanese manual of Sonic 3, the game store kicks off with Sonic finding an ancient ring with scribblings on it that reminded him of an ancient civilization. I don't know if this was an intentional callback to anything like that, but I still like this quite a bit. This is really cool. The Death Egg accidentally unearthed some ancient relic from the island's past, which, ugh, I don't know, it's just really cool. Anyway, Knuckles accidentally activates it, warps into this trippy mess, and then recounts that the writing on the side of the ring called this the Dream Country, or Nightmare Country, which was his ancient people's way of describing what is now called the Special Zone. And I don't need to tell any Sonic fan from any part of the world what the Special Zone is. What I do probably need to tell you about is this crazy screen face that appears right behind Knuckles. From what I understand, it's basically an omnipotent, sentient computer program. This dude's shown up in Sonic the Comic prior to this point, and if I'm screwing up the exact description of that, I do apologize, but he's basically Zordon. He protects the special zone, and he can warp you from one place to another across all of the dimensions and the universe. I'm assuming, anyway. That's what I'm gathering from this story. And he's ticked off with Knuckles from he last knew he was an ally of Robotnik. So this omnipotent beam is just not up to date with his news. He isn't aware that Knuckles was tricked by Robotnik, and actually helped take him down in the previous story. He assumes Knuckles is here on Robotnik's behalf to cause some problems. So in response, Zordon calls upon his Power Rangers, or, sorry, the Chaotix crew, and we get this fantastic splash page of all of our favorite Chaotix members. Vector, Espio, Mighty, Charmy, the, uh, uh, Knack the, the Weasel, or Fang the Sniper, if you're going to be pretentious about it. And that's where things leave off for chapter one. These are actually really short chapters, and they split them up from issue to issue. The story takes place from issue 53 through issue 58. And yeah, I have to admit, I'm intrigued to carry on, because what the heck is Knack doing there? So let's continue on. The story continues, and instead of starting off with the Chaotix, we instead start with Robotnik's deserted Egg Fortress. But maybe it's not as deserted as it was once thought. Robotnik has left it behind, but somebody still resides. And it turns out it's Metal Sonic and Metal Sonic. That's right, we get a pair of metals, and they are known as the Metallics. That's just the name of all robotic Sonics in Fleetway Sonic. And this is a big deal because every time a metallic 
Talix has shown up, it's been a major pain in the backside. They're really tough to take down and have a powerful beam that can take you out in one go. So seeing two of them here lets longtime readers know that, yes, uh, whatever's going on with the Chaotix, they're in for quite a challenge. We then kick back over to Knuckles facing off against the Chaotix. And this is really cool. This shows us the characterizations of each character fairly well. And once again, this is back in the 90s when all we really had was the game Knuckles Chaotix and whatever you can gather from the manuals or what Sega would allow the comic writers to use. Immediately, we figure out the group dynamic. Vector looks far more serious than he did in the game. He's actually the team leader, sounding off commands for each of the Chaotix members, sending Mighty out first to attack. And this version of Mighty is a lot more aggressive. They really lean into the muscly, angry boy. And they show off he does have a lot of power taking out the platform Knuckles was on, but he's not quick enough to catch the Echidna who glides off, leaving Mighty to fall into nothingness. From there, Vector sends off Charmy to rescue Mighty. <laughs> oh man, first words out of his mouth, Charmy is immediately annoying. <laughs> That's kind of like the most British thing ever. Righty doody doo! What is that? <laughs> So yeah, they uh they nailed Charmy in in one go. This version of him is a kid and he is obnoxious. But instead of being a bother to Vector like he would be in the modern games, he seems to really get under the skin of my like, golly, that knuckle sure made a fool out of you. He sure did, Mighty. <laughs> it's just fantastic. And before the page ends, we are introduced to Espio the same way we did in Archie, somewhat. He's invisible, and then he's not. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> But unlike the Archie book, he just straight up strangles Knuckles, man. Oh my god. Okay, so apparently Espio's just holding him in place, so Neck can, I, I don't know, stab him with that tooth. But the weasel's just not quick enough as Knuckles knocks the chameleon into him. And this is when Vector appears to try his hand at the battle, seeing that Knuckles won't find him so easy to take down. Knuckles like, yeah, what can you do? <laughs> Vector's like, dude, I'm a crocodile. And then just tries to eat Knuckles. Like, I mean, when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. You never really see predatory animals act predatory in the world of Sonic. And Vector just looks like a <laughs> demon in this drawing. It's great. So yeah, he tries to take off Knuckles' head, and Knuckles responds in kind with a fist in his mouth. Just then the Omni viewer returns. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, guys. Nope. Uh, my bad. I didn't mean to call a death squad on you. He's actually telling the truth. He's actually a pretty sweet boy. But they really don't have time to swap apologies or have Knuckles brag that he just took out all these brand new characters pretty easily. And Charmy says, hey, Omni viewer, are you getting acne? <laughs> the screen's like, what, what are you talking about? Apparently there's some images forming inside the Omni viewer who says that that's impossible. Nothing can get into his personal workspace without his permission. I feel like there's a find a computer room joke in there somewhere, but I'm too tired to make it. And Knuckles sees some very familiar images. That of the Metallics's. That's where issue 54 ends. 55 picks up right where we left off, with the Parametal Sonics really messing up the Omni Viewer's day. And while the Chaotix can see the pair of robots, they're actually on the other side of the Omni Viewer. Not like literally right behind them. They can't just go around the Omni Viewer and punch these robots out. They're on the other side of this portal and they cannot break through. And the Omni Viewer is freaking out because they are not supposed to be there. The Metallics have locked them out. And they pull out this little doohickey, which sucks up the Omni Viewer, which lets off a blinding light, and suddenly they're gone, leaving nothing but an empty frame in front of the Chaotix. Now, the two separate parties point out two separate reasons why this is a big bad deal. Knuckles has faced off against one of these robots before, and they fought him and Sonic to a standstill, and it was just one that time. So two of them is a big problem. The Chaotix understand what the Omni Viewer is. Keep in mind, Knuckles has not seen this thing before. They understand that having him in the wrong hands can also be a very bad thing. So, without really wasting time explaining things, they realize they gotta work together and they gotta go stop these robots. But Nack's like, hold up guys, I don't I don't trust this red boy right here. He might be up to something. And Espio's like, hey man, Omni Viewer vouched for him. It's fine. Of course, Omni Viewer wanted us to kill him, like two minutes prior to that point, but no big deal. And that's really all they spend on that little subplot of Nack not trusting Knuckles, these two panels. <laughs> Knuckles just straight up ignores the accusation. Right back to the leader of the group, like, so, uh, what's the game plan? Where would they have 
taking the Omni Viewer. Chaotix, being the protectors of the special zone, know that Robotnik's Egg Fortress is still intact and still in the zone, and that's the only logical place for them to go. So they uh, hero pose their way out of the scene. We then cut to the Egg Fortress zone and find ourselves in front of a big red Metal Sonic. Now this is the comics interpretation of Metal Sonic Kai, type Metal Sonic, whatever you want to call him. And no, he doesn't have the big crazy fangs or any of that other stuff, but this is still a really cool design. He's stationary and obviously in charge of the two smaller Metal Sonics. Speaking of, they've just arrived back in front of their Emperor, and they want the Omni Viewer for some nefarious purpose. Omni Viewer's like, you're not gonna get away with it! And the Emperor's just like, just shut him up, turn him off, just mute, mute the guy, thank you. Okay. Outside of the fortress, the Chaotix have already arrived. Mighty's like, get out of my way, man! I'm gonna take care of it! Knuckles is trying to calm him down, and... <laughs> <laughs> Mighty's like, waiting's for wimps! Yeah, so Mighty in this interpretation, if you can't tell already, is basically the Raphael or the Wolverine of the crew, which is obviously a very different interpretation compared to the Archie version, but so far I'm really liking these guys because I immediately know what they're all about. As opposed to that first Archie book, outside of the Jive Talking Gator, it was really hard to interpret different personalities between the different characters. So yeah, thanks to Mighty, the alarm gets set off and now they have to do it the hard way. And that's where the story ends for issue 55. Issue 56 picks back up right in front of the Egg Fortress, back with the Metallics Emperor. And all he's basically doing is telling the two smaller Metallics to go take care of the enemies and just talking trash to the muted Omni. <laughs> Cut back to the Chaotix who are moving through the abandoned fortress, and it's quite the mess. Vector just catching us up if you didn't catch the last issue, just reminding everybody that they're in, but the alarms have been set off, and the robots are bound to be zoning in on them. With Espio also reminding the reader, yeah, all thanks to Mighty, who sets off the armadillo, and the two of them begin fist fighting in this super dangerous moment. Knuckles breaks them up just as Charmy returns from some reconnaissance. Let's the team know that one of the Metallics are on their way to their location. To avoid confrontation, Vector opens up a vent and tells everybody to hop on in, which they do, but does a little good as Neck, finger quotes here, accidentally kicks one of the vents open, letting the Metallics know where they are. Neck just bails on them. <laughs> Charmy asks Vector, well, what do we do now? And Vector's like, I suppose they're going to want us to surrender. <laughs> nope. Metal Sonic, I'm sorry, guys. I can't keep saying Metallics. It's too weird for my American brain to handle. Anyway, Metal Sonic blasts the team. <laughs> now, Metal Sonic is strangling Espio. That's what you get when you try to Homer Simpson, everybody. And like with a single swipe, just knocks the entire team on their ass. And Charmy's like, hey, this kind of reminds me of a party. What party? What kind of weird shit do bees get up to in the world of Mobius? Anyway, Metal continues his attack, this time blasting rubble on top of the entire crew. But Knuckles emerges from the rubble, thinking the Chaotic's dead. He's now ticked off and ready to take on the Metallics one on one. Issue 57 picks up with Metallics and Knuckles. Knuckles doing his best to dodge the death lasers coming out of his belly. It's kind of like the Care Bears, except the belly rays will, you know, kill you. And Metal seems to have the upper hand, until Knuckles just chucks an iron bar at him, and just takes him out in one go. Now that the fight is over, Knack reappears saying, hey, that was, that was amazing! Knuckles wanted to know where the heck he went off to, but it doesn't really matter at the moment. They gotta see if they can rescue the Chaotix. But not to fear, cause Mighty, using his incredible strength, lifts the rubble off the team. With Knuckles reassuring them, not to worry, the robot's been taken out. Yes, feel like sure about that? Yes, even with a hole ripped through his gut, the Metallics robot gets back up. <laughs> oh, Knuckles here. Oh, flippin' heck. <laughs> oh, man. We get a couple more panels of the Emperor just talking mad trash to the Zordon knockoff, then cut back to the team running down the hall with... <laughs> with the damaged Metallics just roaming after them. <laughs> it's like out of Five Nights at Freddy's. That's so creepy. <laughs> Knack leads him into the Emperor's Chamber, where they're surrounded by even more Metal Sonics. And this issue ends with, shocker, Knack's a traitor. Now, if you were not aware of Sonic characters prior to this book, if you were not a big fan of the games, this might have been an interesting twist for you. But for the rest of us who already knew who Knack was, even as a kid, we were introduced to him as a bad guy in the game. This was not a shocking turn of events. We were just kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. But anyway, that's where 57 
ends and 58 begins again with the team surrounded by Metal Sonics and the Emperor Metallics. Team wanting to know, why did Knack betray them? Knack's like money, obviously. You know, that's stuff that doesn't exist in our world. That, that's why. The Emperor thanks Knack for all of his hard work. Without him, they couldn't have done any of this. Knack's one that gave them the Omniviewer access code so they could pull this whole thing off. He's the one that tricked his companions into walking into this trap. But since Knack is no longer useful for them, it's time to take him out. But Knack's not having any of that as he just pulls out a gun out of his hat. It expands out of nowhere and, well, he is still surrounded by Metal Sonics who blast the guy and knock the gun loose. Knuckles jumps for it, dodging laser blasts and just... <laughs> I want to say I'm shocked seeing Knuckles here holding a gun, but actually Sonic had one in his hand in issue 53 in his own story. <laughs> yeah, you thought Shadow with a gun was silly. No, these these animal men are packing heat in all kinds of cannon. Anyway, even though it looks like it's a, it's a gun, I guess it lets off lasers or something. Like, it generates some kind of wave. I don't, I don't know, man. But it takes out all the robots in one go. Espio checks on Knack, letting the reader know that he is alive. He didn't take the full brunt of the blast. Vector checks on the Omni Viewer, who looks like he's doing fine, and the team take their exit, with the Omni Viewer returning Knuckles to Angel Island. Seems like they wrapped everything up pretty quickly, considering how many issues we had to get through to get to this point. And if it seemed too easy, you'd be right. The backup systems are activated, and the Emperor returns to full form. I mean, as it turns out, this was his plan all along. Their enemies now believe they are destroyed, and now they have their own copy of the Omni Viewer. <laughs> <laughs> and he's all red and meanie face. You guys remember face from Nick Jr.? It's, it's kind of like that if you wanted to kill you. And wow, okay, I was not aware the Omni Viewer was this powerful. They can now move anywhere they want in space and time. Well, the British do love their Doctor Who. And the last panel reveals a whole lot more metallics, with the Emperor declaring the day will soon be here when the Brotherhood of Metallics rules supreme. And the closing line here is like, gee whiz, boomers. <laughs> What? Was that what they called their readers? Were they just that ahead of the curve? Some UK fan explained that to me. Is that like Sonic Boomers? What's going on there? No, oh, well, whatever. So there are going to be a couple nitpicks I will have as an adult reading through this stuff for the very first time. I have noticed a lot of the stories I've seen so far from Fleetway Sonic. The feature artists bring in designs that don't mesh well with Sonic whatsoever. But that's not to say they are bad artists, not by any stretch of the imagination. It more feels like these are artists who got a job drawing for Sonic and desperately want to draw anything outside of Sonic sometimes. And I feel like some of Richard Elson's designs are a little weird for me. I'm thinking specifically of his rendition of Modern Sonic. And the weird jelly bean bodies don't really look super great doing action poses a lot of the time. And I, I don't know, I'm still trying to get the hang of Knuckles' little white ring as a necklace as opposed to just being part of his body. That said, again, you can really tell there's a talented artist putting this stuff together. This looks really nice. And I can already understand why people grew up as big fans of Nigel Kitching's scripts. This stuff isn't revolutionary, but it's still a step above what you'd expect from a book about Sonic the Hedgehog, especially back in the 90s. And as you can see, they're not afraid to take a lot of the game lore and do something unique and interesting with it. Archie and Fleetway took some drastically different changes from the core games, and that's okay, that's fine. But back in the 90s, when all you really had for extended media was whatever the comic books would dish out, it would sometimes be frustrating if they veered too far far away from whatever you love from the games. That was a big problem for me growing up. And I can tell you right now, I would have had some issues as a kid with some of the changes they took with this particular version of the story, but it's not like I had the original story to begin with in America, you know? The Japanese manual told a very different thing from what I got in America. And I already would have loved this version better. I was so upset about that ugly rendition of Metal Sonic in the American version of the Chaotic story, because that was all I had of Metal Sonic. I had a couple of games. I had the 25th issue of the Archie book, which was gorgeous by the way. And then I had that. I was waiting so long to see that design again, and that's what they gave me. It's not like today where you just can't get rid of Metal Sonic. He's everywhere. It was really hard to come by some of these really unique and cool designs brought to us by the game sometime. But here, they made some changes I probably would have been down with as a kid. We get more than one Metal Sonic. We get the big red one who's his own villain in his own right. 
And while I do like some other interpretations of the characterizations of the Chaotix, again, they were super well defined here, outside of like maybe Espio. And Nax really only there to betray the team, which I saw coming, but as far as the story is concerned, he doesn't really have anything to do outside of not trusting Knuckles, only to turn out to be a dick. All Espio does in this story so far is talk trash to Mighty and to the Rottle <laughs> Knuckles. But I'm sure I'll see more of him and the rest of the team as the Fleetway comic continues. I'm not sure how I feel about bringing in all these brand new characters only to have their asses kicked and then not really do anything. Like they had rubble thrown on them. They got tricked by Knack to running into the Metallic's hive, if you will. And Knuckles is the one that had to save them through this entire story. Still, again, this is obviously just a kicking off point. They didn't wrap up everything with a neat little bow. The Brotherhood of Metallic's are a brand new threat and we are going to see them again. And I would assume we're going to see more of the Chaotix. And as I will point point out in some videos coming up here pretty soon, there's a surprising amount of parallels between this version of the team and what the games would ultimately define as canon. Long and short of it, yes, this is not the greatest comic book you're ever going to read. It's not even the greatest Sonic comic book you're ever going to read, but Sonic comic fans in the UK got a quality product here. This is really cool and I'm really excited to see more of it. And I hope you're excited to see more of November Chaotix. I'll be back very soon with a brand new video. Until then, uh, toot toot tootly doo! <laughs>